Welcome to worship at Gender Road Christian Church. I'm Pastor Margot. And uh, we begin the service acknowledging the horror of the invasion of the Ukraine and how easy it is for us to feel helpless. And I remind you of what we can do. We can give uh, through our church to the Week of Compassion. It is a relief, refugee, and development mission fund through the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. And with the invasion of the Ukraine, we are, within the Week of Compassion, working with the ACT Alliance and the European Baptist Federation, which is focusing on providing relief and response. We know that over two million Ukrainians have left their homes, arriving in neighboring nations for refuge. And in addition, a significant number of internally displaced people remain inside the Ukraine. And as I said, I know we can all feel helpless, but what we can do is we can give, and the Week of Compassion is one trustworthy place to give, and we can pray. We begin with prayer. This prayer is from the Week of Compassion. Let us pray together. God of the great and small, you hold all in your care. We pray safety for Ukraine's people generosity from those rendering aid, and comfort for countless families separated and terrified. Christ of compassion and peace, your love never fails, never runs out, never wanes. We pray with deep gratitude for those who put hands and feet and faces to your goodness. Spirit of mercy and justice, may your wisdom prevail we pray for clarity and discernment with desperate words, but also with great confidence that your true shalom might reach every corner it has yet to find. Spirit of abiding hope, Christ of expansive welcome, God of outrageous love, we are yours. In your mercy, hear our prayers, and may we put those prayers to work. Amen. Um, Jesus is talking to his disciples, preparing for his uh, hour that has come where he will be um, betrayed and tried, crucified, and, uh, and we'll get into the rest of that story. So as we look at this week, just a couple quick things for announcements to make sure you're aware of. Uh, we are always looking to uh, have folks attend the Lenten soup and stories that we have where folks are sharing part of their faith journey, their, um, their, their spiritual understanding, just a, a part of their life. And so this Tuesday at six, beginning at 6.30, we'll have vegetable soup and some rolls. And then Nan Vandegrift, her story. Last week, we had um, Alex, who was able to share uh, his story. So that's every Tuesday at 6.30. I encourage you to come. Soup's on. Anytime you can get there after 6.30, and then we wrap up at 7.30. Additionally, uh, we are always looking for folks to be part of the choir and the praise team. So if you like to sing, uh, we'd love to have you sing, and that's something you want to do to help uh, lead worship, be part of the worship. Uh, see Charlotte, who is our choir director, Alex, who's our praise team director, but uh, the more voices we can lift up to the Lord in song, uh, the more joyful noise that is. And so with that, uh, let's uh, get ready to, um, uh, as, as we prepare to sing, we found this little video which sort of gets at uh, our need to serve Christ in the right way. Our gospel lesson for today is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, and as in the past, weeks, it will be presented in a dramatic fashion. Just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come to leave this world to go to the Father. Having loved his dear companions, he continued to love them right to the end. It was supper time. The devil by now had Judas son of Simon the Iscariot, firmly in his grip, all set for betrayal. Jesus knew that the Father had put him in complete charge of everything, that he came from God, and that he was on his way back to God. 
So, he got up from the supper table. He poured water into a basin and began to wash the feet of the disciples, drying them with his apron. When he got to Simon Peter, Master, you wash my feet? You don't understand now what I'm doing, but it will be clear enough to you later. You're not going to wash my feet ever. If I do not wash you, you can't be part of what I'm doing. No, no, not so fast. Wash my feet, wash my hands, wash my face. If you've had a bath in the morning, you need only wash your feet now, and you're clean from head to toe. My concern, you see, is holiness, not hygiene. So, now you're clean, but not everyone. He knew who was betraying him. That's why he said, not every one of you. After he had finished washing their feet, he took his robe, put it back on, and went back to his place at the table. Do you understand what I've done for you? You address me as teacher and master, and rightly so. That is what I am. So if I, the master and teacher, have washed your feet, so you must now wash one another's feet. I've laid down a pattern for you. What I have done, you must now do. I'm only pointing out the obvious. A, a servant is not ranked above his master. An employee does not give orders to the employer. So, if you understand what I'm telling you, then you may act like it. And do what I have done and have a blessed life. Amen. What do you see? When you look around the room, what do you see? Maybe different places in your life. When you look around the room, you get a sense of who's there. Maybe you're eating dinner. You look around the table, who's seated there with you? Generally, when you're eating dinner, you're going to have family there. You're going to have friends. You're going to have people that you know people that you trust in, believe in, people that you believe are on your side. Jesus was there. It was mealtime. It was at the table. All his disciples were there. And he looked around the room. He looked at those who were at the table with him. And yet Jesus was still going to wash the feet of all who were there. In this passage from John 13, it's only in the Gospel of John do we find this act of foot washing uh, in the four Gospels. So Jesus is there, and as part of the farewell discourse, it's, it's these teachings from chapters 13 through 17 are really where Jesus is at his most pastoral, his most intimate, his most instructional, his trying to convey the things that still are needed for understanding who he is, what he was about, and what he was doing on earth. You might think of it as, um, as we talked about from this past Tuesday in our Zoom Bible study, you may think of it like if you've gone on a trip or you've gone on vacation, you need somebody to take care of your house, your pets. Maybe you're going to go away and they're going to watch your kids. Maybe it's the first time uh, you've, you've ever left your young one in the charge of somebody else. Maybe like your parents. They raised you, yet you think you need to tell them a whole bunch of stuff, right? But this is kind of what's happening. Jesus is talking to his disciples to convey stuff because he is preparing to leave. 
He looks around the room and he's seen all the folks who were there with him in the Gospel of John in chapter 13 through 17. This is the farewell discourse. This is where Jesus is at his most pastoral. He's instructing, he's helping the disciples understand what it is that is going to happen to him. In the Gospel of John, we do not have a baptism story. In the Gospel of John, we do not have a Eucharist story. So this is not the Last Supper as we commonly understand things to be. This is where Jesus is there in Soon, one of his 12 disciples will betray him. In this Last Supper, Jesus will stoop down and will wash the feet of those who are around him. In verse 1, it finishes up where it says that Jesus loved those until the end, until it's finished. And let's go ahead and put the scripture up there. He loved them until the end. What does that mean? Well, several ways we can look at that is he loved them up until he was crucified and breathed his last breath and gave up his spirit. He loved them until the end of his time here on earth. But to love them till the end means that he had to love them from the beginning. He's been with them throughout their whole journey. He's loved them since he first called them. He's loved them when they didn't understand him. He's loved them when they've argued with him. He's loved them when they failed to act in the right way. He loved them when they looked at others as the world looks at others. He's loved them with all of their good and bad and probably their cranky days and irritable days and maybe when they didn't do much days. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This Jesus who's loved them, loves us ever since Jesus knew you, called you, reached out to you. We have to understand this in comparison to what the world says you need to perform, you need to produce, you need to, you need to, you need to, you need to. We can't stress enough that you are enough how you are. You are enough how you are, and Jesus loves you because he looked around the room and decided that he was going to give us a model, a pattern of what love looks like in washing the feet of another. He looked around the room at those who he knew would betray him, who he knew would deny him, And yet he still washed the feet. He still loved them. That's tough for us to follow. That's tough for us to replicate, right? When we look around the room, maybe you look around the room where you work, you look around the room where you're at school, you look around your school bus, you look around the group of friends, you look at those who you're on a team with, I don't know, wherever it is, you look around the room and there's probably some people there, you're like, oh, if I never saw them again, I'd be okay. Right? Yeah. And then Jesus has this audacity to be like, hey, I want you to love others. And so what I look at as we read this passage is, well, what does it take for us to be able to do that? How do we prepare ourselves to do this? Because the first chapters 2 through 12 in the Gospel of John that we've been covering took over three years to accomplish. And now verses 13 through 17 will happen in the span of 24 hours. For three years, Jesus was trying to teach the disciples, to coach the disciples, to mentor the disciples, to love the disciples, to show them a way to think and act, to follow a way. How do we do that ourselves? When Jesus got up from the table, the verbs that are being used are he arose, to rise up. It was an act of power, it was an act of love, it was an act of purposeful fulfillment that the hour of which Jesus Christ had come come for was happening. Jesus arose. He looked around the table. And then in verse six, once Peter realizes what is happening, Jesus had washed the feet of a few others. And Peter, who we know is impetuous and, and just you know, wants to, to be all there and say all things, he's not quite grasping it. He's like, Jesus, don't not only wash my feet, like if you're gonna do that, I want you to wash all parts of me. 
But Jesus knew that they didn't quite understand what was happening yet. He's like, no, this is not about you being clean in the ways of which we think, but it's, this is a, an event, an act of which I'm going to take you to the cross. If you want to go to the cross with me, if you want to partake of the salvation that I offer, the abundant life that I offer, you must let me wash your feet. You see, this term wash is, was used only, the only other time it was used is when Jesus washed the eyes of the blind man. You see, he washed away, washed away those things that was keeping the blind man from seeing who Jesus was, from believing in who Jesus was, from understanding who Jesus was. Jesus washes us so that we might see and understand and believe in who Jesus is. That's why he said, there's one of you who is not clean. Judas didn't understand Judas didn't see, Judas didn't believe in this Jesus. But yet Jesus still washed his feet. Jesus looked around the room. He bent down. And in words written some 350 years ago, one theologian described it as heaven stoops to earth to wash. It's a model, it's a pattern, it's an understanding of the word made flesh of who God is and all the ministry and everything that Jesus was trying to teach us. So we don't wanna see this in just an isolated event that you must wash the feet, foot of another, it's an example but it's you must be willing to love another, serve and follow and be along this way to put into action the faith, to be doers of the word. Because Jesus says, if you go and do, you'll lead a blessed life, you'll have a blessed life, you will be blessed. How would that be a blessing in your life if you go and do and if you go and love? So I started thinking, well, what does it take in order for us to do this, to fully understand, to be willing to submit our pride and our humility? I think it looks at what disciplines of the faith are we practicing. Lent is oftentimes a, a, a time of where we really focus on removing things from our life or adding additional disciplines in there. And because of the pandemic and the struggles of the last two years, we just did not want to theologically beat ourselves up during this time of Lent for these six weeks. But to focus on the good and how we emerge as followers of Jesus Christ. What do we learn? And so these disciplines that we talk about, how are we putting them into practice? Do you see the disciplines of the faith as something of, of a legalistic mandate or do you see that this as an invitation, a privilege? Beth Moore on her Twitter back and forth with her million followers was getting into a discussion of that this week. Disciplines, what are maybe some disciplines that you can think of? Prayer, Bible study, giving, reading the Bible, hearing the Bible read, attending worship, serving, doing for others, How are you practicing those? Because I think we need to be able to do them, to have these disciplines as part of our life so that when this opportunity happens where we might model Christ, follow the way, wash the foot of another, another we might be somewhat ready, prepared for it. And I say somewhat purposefully. Because if you wait to be fully ready to do anything, you're really missing the point. It is Christ in you who's in you through the Holy Spirit, Jesus who abides in you and you abiding in Jesus that empowers you to do things beyond that which you thought you could do, to think it away beyond which you could do. 
And so Jesus is here. Beth Moore did write, the next generation learns how to practice their faith from watching you. The next generation learns how to practice their faith from watching you. Who brings your kids to church? Who brings your grandkids to church? They'll learn from what they see you do and from what you stress as important. How are you living your life? Having discussions throughout the week of when you mess things up or what you struggle with. The worst thing that we can do with our kids is to say, well, just pray and it'll make everything all right. Because then they become 13, 14, 15, and 16. And you know what happens with teenagers at that age. And then they pray and things don't turn out like you said they would. And then they're mad at you and they're mad at God and then they don't want to come to church. And I know coming to church or you're watching from home is not everything, but it is part of the faith discipline. We are meant to be in worship together. We are meant to be physically around each other as people of faith to be bolstered in the faith so that when these opportunities of everything that Jesus has taught us, we might understand it and be ready to act in a way that that are doers of the word. James 1 talks about being doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. You can hear the word being talked about, but then what are you doing during the week? And when are you able to say, you know what? I messed this up. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Here's what we can do differently. Tomorrow's a new day. Because you see, Jesus is going to, after washing the feet of the disciples, after telling Judas, go do what you need to do, Jesus is going to talk about the greatest commandment of love, that you love one another. In John 13, 34, he says, I give you this new commandment that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. By this, by you doing this, they will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. In verse 17, or Jesus says, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Doing them. Loving. They'll know you are my disciples. Do they know that we are disciples of Jesus when we spew hate? and junk that we post on social media? Do they know we are disciples of Christ when we treat others poorly? When we're stingy and not generous? Do they know that we are disciples when we don't love and we seek to have our own way in everything? That you love one another. Jesus was empowering us to be able to see and to do and to love, but we have to figure that out together. This community of faith and the community connected online and and the people that worship at the next service, we're all a community of faith that discusses and talks and understands and lives and works and, and tries to figure out what does it mean to be a follower of Christ where I am in my life, where you are in your life, the challenges that you are facing. In John chapter 13, verse 35, by everyone, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have loved one another. He didn't say, if you judge one another and pretend that you are the most Christian and condemn others. I'm gonna err on the side of love. And sometimes love hurts. And sometimes love is difficult. And sometimes love takes talking things through. And sometimes love takes listening. When you look around the room, when you look around the room, when you look around the bell choir room, the choir room, the sanctuary, when you look around again, the people that you're sitting with at your table, 
the people there, has everyone in your family just met all your expectations? Like, has everyone in your family just done everything right for you? Has you ever complained about anybody in your family? Right? And if, if an individual family unit struggles and talks, then why do we sometimes hold these unrealistic expectations on how it should be at work or school or in a church or anywhere else? People will know that you are a follower of Christ by how you love. By how you love. Last week, ta- last week we talked about one of the signs of being healthy is the ability, how quickly you recover from being sick. As a Christian, how do you recover from being hurt? from being disappointed, from experiencing the trauma, the negativity? How are you, through your disciplines, understanding that this Jesus and God loves you and has been with you this whole way? Never promising, never acting you to be, asking you to be perfect. There's a string of Christianity that just loves to beat us up saying you're worthless, you're not good enough, and you can't do anything without Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus Christ gives us salvation and his grace and a gift, but God made you in God's image. Made you all in God's image and loves you and reaches out to you through Jesus Christ. So when we look around the room, what do you see? When you look around the table, what do you see? in understanding what we're asked to do, how might you imagine the world to be when you look around the room? When you look around the room, what do you want to see knowing that this are the opportunities and the ways in which you can make a difference? You can rewrite your story. The narrative can change based upon what you can do. Because God asked you to wash the feet, to follow this way. Amen.